Good afternoon, guys, or evening, or morning, whenever it is that you're able to listen to this and watch this. Um, I hope you guys are doing well today, Tuesday, May the 17th. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, let's get into our PowerPoint lectures. I am doing a different recording app today, so hopefully we can have more than five minutes per video. Um, all right, let's do a slight little review. We have Paul Cezanne with Mont Saint Victoire, and he was Cubism. He is um, flattening out round forms or three dimensional forms. We also have another Cubist artist. I I just realized that the top of the screen um, has a typo, not Pablo. It's Pablo Picasso. Pablo Picasso, Les Desmoiselles de Avignon. Femme fatale, primitivism. All right, enough of you, Picasso. Moving along, we've got Alfred Stiglitz who was responsible for elevating photography to fine art. And it's all about composition. It's all about seizing the opportunity, setting up the frame and capturing the moment um, with the steerage. Beautiful image, one of my favorite images. All right, Gustav Klimt, The Kiss. He was influenced by Art Nouveau, which was one of the arts and crafts movement. They were just purely um, focused on a pretty aesthetic, if you will. Um, but he also fit into the symbolism movement, as well as Paul Gauguin and Edward Munch. Gustav Klimt the Kiss. And then you also have a sculpture named The Kiss by Constantin Brancusi. And this one's um, also influenced by primitivism, um, but it's also cubism. <laughs> it's very geometrical and very balanced. Another cubism work, Analytical Cubism by George Brock, the Portuguese taking this idea or this original image of a guitar player and then just completely deconstructing it, making it non-objective for purely compositional reasons. Henri Matisse, the goldfish, he was member of the, which movement? Favism, wild beasts. They used colors like wild beasts. They were expressive in their color, not naturalistic. And his goldfish were inspired by his travels to Morocco. And they're very calming and pretty. And that's what he wanted them to be. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, then you have Kandinsky, abstraction, finding the spiritual and the act of creating art. Synesthesia. Expressionism. He had Ernst Ludwig Kirchner with German Expressionism, self portrait as a soldier, psychological trauma from World War I. More um, emotional trauma from World War I era, um, the assassination of Karl Liebknecht by Kath Kollwitz. Then you have Piet Mondrian, composition with red, blue, and yellow. And this was the movement of De Stigil, new plastic, breaking everything down in the universe into these universal elements, like colors and shapes and lines. We're all just colors and shapes and lines, is what Piet Mondrian would have said. We also have graphic designer Vivara Stepanova 
and her photo montage critique of Stalin's il- or Stalin's five-year plan with her illustration from the results of the first five-year plan. And yesterday we left off with Marit Oppenheim and her juxtaposition of these um, objects and deconstructing their functions. And then you also have the context where Andre Breton named it Breakfast in Furs and gave it a whole nother meaning by doing so. Which leads us into today's first work, The Two Fridas by Frida Kahlo and 1939 Oil on Canvas. She's really popular in pop culture nowadays. I wonder how she would feel about that. She'd probably love it and hate it all at the same time, just like we're seeing two different parts of her personalities here in the two Fridas. So, Frida Kahlo, she was a Mexican artist, and she primarily created self-portraits. Here's one self-portrait of her. I'll tell you the story about that. Um, self-portrait, self-portrait, she is quoted saying that she paints herself because she is the person she knows best. Um, and it's all very autobiographical. She was also inspired by Mexico and nature and her heritage. She has this real folk art style to her artworks. Some may call her a surrealist artist, although she was not a part of the group of artists that called themselves surrealist artists. Um, She uh, explored the theme of identity within her artwork. As I mentioned, it's mostly autobiographical, mixed with fantasy. Um, She was a member of the Mexican movement of artists that were aimed to define Mexican identity. Her husband, uh, Diego Rivera, being one of those fellow artists. And they were just really aiming to be very prideful about Mexico and um, have artwork to showcase that. Um, She had her work exhibited by Andre Breton, the surrealist artist in Manhattan, Um, which helped to get her commissions and helped to get her a little bit of fame at the time. Um, This painting in particular, the two Frida, is about her two identities, her Mexican identity and her modern sort of more European identity. Um, Her mother was Mexican and her father was German. She grew up in Mexico City. Um, And you can see that over on the right, she's got maybe more of a traditional Mexican dress, a Tijuana is what it's called. And on the left, she has this more sort of German, European, modern at the time, um, fashionable dress. So it's um, showcasing her two personalities. She painted this shortly after her divorce from her husband, Diego Rivera. And there she's holding a little tiny locket of her husband, Diego. Um, And she also painted this after um, a tumultuous event with her husband, Diego. So let's take a pause. Her and her husband, Diego Rivera, did not have a very good marriage. he he was a womanizer, and after years of him um, having affairs on her, she, she turned around and did the same with him, etc. Very fiery relationship. Um, she painted this painting after she um, caught her husband and her sister together. Um, and um, he used to always comment on how much he loved her hair, and so she decided to... Um, paint herself, cutting off all her hair, and wearing his clothing, um, despite him. She also had um, a background with a lot of physical pain. So when she was a teenager, 
She was riding a streetcar in Mexico City, and it got in a terrible accident, and she ended up having part of a power pole, a wooden power pole, impale her back. And so she often in her life were, would spend periods of times in her bed with a huge back brace on and dealt with a lot of pain that was associated with that injury. Um, so when you look at this painting, you can see that she's painting this, uh, this physical pain that she feels. So back to the two Fridas. So she painted this shortly after her divorce from Diego. Um, it showcases her two personalities. One is um, a traditional Frida with a traditional um, indigenous dress and a broken heart. And she sits next to an independent modern Frida. Um, they're holding hands and their hearts are visible. And then you have a tumultuous sky, a stormy sky in the background that's supposed to reflect her turmoil. Her turmoil for um, her and her husband divorcing and her physical turmoil that she dealt with for her entire life. She was um, sort of a loner and often wore this indigenous clothing. Um, and part of the function of her artworks was flouting the conventions of beauty and social expe expectations of her as um, a modern Mexican woman. So she was sort of a rebel in that sense. Um, a good takeaway and a good function as well for this painting is um, that you have these two Fridas, where one is weak, the other is strong. So one is heartbroken, she just divorced her husband, but then the other one is there to carry her through that. Um, and again, we do have this uh, anatomy that shows up in her artwork a lot, which is related to her physical ailments from her accident when she was a teenager. Be sure to look at the document of supplemental, supplemental videos um, to go along with our lectures today as you take your notes. Also, a good tip, guys, as we're going through this with this learning at home and you're listening to my um, screencasted lectures, why don't you keep a little notepad with you while you're taking your notes and on that notepad, write down any questions that might arise as you're listening to my lectures. That way you can um, remember what confused you about certain works and you can send me questions about them and I can help answer them for you. So write down any questions you have on little sticky pads or whatever in the margin of your notes. All right, moving along. Jacob Lawrence and the Migration Series, or formally known as this title. Um, but I'm going to say Migration Series. All right. He painted this in 1940 to 1941, and he was um, a painter known for his portrayal of African American life. He was an African American artist, and he grew up in Harlem. He would refer to his own work as being dynamic cubism, but we can also throw him in the category of self-taught folk art and Harlem art from the Harlem Renaissance. All right. So he, part of the function of all of his artworks was bringing African-American experience to life and different ways that he used this was simply with his color palette. He would use these neutral colors, these browns and blacks, and he would juxtapose those with really bright, vivid colors. Um, the migration series that we're looking at here, this is a part of the migration series, a couple more images. Um, the Migration Series, it depicts the migration of African-American migrant workers that started to migrate north from the south in the 1910s. 
you had new job opportunities up in the northern states, and you had African Americans living down in Jim Crow South who wanted to migrate north to escape the Jim Crow South. Now, as we can see in this painting right here, they still don't, whoa, sorry, they still don't entirely escape the racism. Um, so we're, we're, we see this restaurant scene, right? We're presumably up north of the Mason-Dixon line at this point in time in his series. Yet yeah, there's still a sectioned off part for African Americans to dine and um, white Americans to dine. So again, he's showcasing the everyday life of African Americans in, um, in this uh, Jim Crow era, if you will. So his parents migrated from the South to New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and then he grew up in Harlem. So his family would have had this experience firsthand of migrating. So let's look at um, his panels in the migration series. There's this great website, lawrencemigration.com or .phillipscollection.org. Um, let's just take a look. And they're all titled with um, like sentence-long titles. So this is the first one. Oopsies. Are they going to not show the titles? I will just flip through. Migrant workers, traveling, getting work where they can. Okay, the labor agent recruited unsuspecting laborers as strike breakers for Northern Industries. The migrants found improved housing when they arrived north. I'm just gonna skip around and read some of the titles here for you guys. This website is not very interactive with my computer. Um, in the north, the African American had more educational opportunities. And the migrants kept coming. The migrants, having moved suddenly into a crowded and an unhealthy environment, soon contracted tuberculosis. The death rate rose. Oh, yeah, there was that tuberculosis pandemic. Um, here's our painting. They found discrimination in the north. It was kind. It was different kind. And so this is showing the different kind of segregation in the north as opposed to the south. In the south, the, the racism and segregation was very in your face. In the north, it may have been something as subtle but still present as um, this divided dining room here. Let's look at some more. In a few sections of the South, leaders of both black and white communities met to discuss ways of making the South a good place to live. To make it difficult for the migrants to leave, they are arrested en masse. They often miss their trains. So he is depicting the plight and what these migrant workers and migrant travelers from the South up to the North would have experienced and gone through. The crops were left to dry and rot. There was no one to tend to them. The migration gained in momentum. Um, so if you're more interested in this series, I encourage you to look up this migration series and read through all of these um, titles. All right. So let's go back to our slideshow from current slide. Again, if you have any questions about the migration series and Jacob Lawrence and um, his important place as an African-American Harlem Renaissance artist on the 250, let me know. All right. So you may have noticed that for Tuesday's works, I skipped under Over the Jungle by Wilfredo Lamb because we already covered him at the beginning of the year. So don't worry about that. You guys already know all about Alfredo Lamb in the Jungle, the Cuba African artist. Um, he was 
inspired by surrealism and cubism, etc., etc. But the last work um, I'm going to lecture for you guys today is going to be work number 433, Dream of a Sunday Afternoon in the Alameda Park by Diego Rivera. Yes, Frida Kahlo's husband. Um, he painted this mural in 1947 and finished it in 1948. And this mural is a fresco, the wet paint into plaster. So, he was a Mexican painter and a Mexican muralist. Here is a good photo for scale for this mural. This mural would have been located in Alameda Park. And think of this park in comparison to like Central Park in, in New York City. It is like the central gathering place. Um, and it's a really famous park in Mexico City. All right, so Diego Rivera, he fits into social realism. So think back to our realist movement in the 1850s, and that was realism, and you have artists like Gustave Courbet who is showcasing the realities of life for people that he saw and experienced. Um, and this is social realism. So you have Diego Rivera who is um, making social commentary through his own almost folk arty style as well. So in this painting, he's got lots of personal references and he also has lots of references to the country of Mexico and different leaders and historical events and very important cultural figures too. So social realism and Mexican muralism. And the theme of this one is Mexican history. You have these uh, meaningful portraits, you have historical figures and symbolic elements. And think of this as a festive pictorial autobiography of Diego himself, actually. He is in the middle of the painting. And guys, he painted himself as a child. Do you see this? Do you see what this man did? Now, I thought I had a picture of Diego. Look up a picture of Diego Rivera. He was not the most like beautiful man in the world, but it just kills me every time that I look at this mural and he's painted himself as a child, and look at who is right behind him with her hand on his shoulder. Yes, it's our girl Frida. All right, so um, he's in the middle as a child who holds hands with Calavera Katrina. Calavera Katrina, um, made famous by printmaker Jose Guadalupe Posada. And um, she is a really famous sort of like Day of the Dead type of figure. Um, and she shows up, this image shows up in Mexican pop culture all over the place. And so she is a really important um, pop culture icon for the identity of Mexico, Calavera Katrina. So he is right next to her. So that's, you know, showcasing his Mexican pride. Um, and he's also representing himself joining this quintessential symbol of Mexican pop culture. And he is shown to be protected by his wife, Frida Kahlo, because, uh, guys, Frida Kahlo is a strong lady, all right? She's protecting him because he's a man-child. <laughs> um, she is holding a yin and yang, the Eastern equivalent of the Aztec duality symbol which we will talk all about next week when we get to our Indigenous Americans unit. But she's holding this yin and yang, which is this Eastern symbol that's equivalent to an Aztec duality ideal. He is combining his childhood experiences with political demonstrations of the 19th century. Uh, 
Um, it's painted on the outside of a crematorium for the victims of the Inqu Inquisition during the conquering of the land by Cortes. For some context for you, um, he's showing the U.S.'s encampment in the park. He's um, painting that within this painting. So um, you've also got different important political leaders and events that happened during the history of Mexico winning its independence all throughout this painting. You even, if you look closely, will see um, some communist leaders because he, he agreed with this ideal of communism and this theory of communism. And uh, Frida would have called herself a communist as well. Um, so you do have some of those figures sprinkled throughout in this painting too. Um, in this painting, I spy Hernan Cortez. I even spy Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz, who is our nun, right? So I will let you guys search for them. This will be a fun little I spy. I spy Hernan, Hernan Cortez. I spy Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz. I spy Benito Juarez, who was the first president of Mexico. So lots of important Mexican figures, important Mexican historical events, and important to Diego um, personal events and personal ideologies. Um, a little bit of fun background information on him and his affiliation with communism is that he was commissioned by Rockefeller to paint a big mural right as you walk into the big Rockefeller um, skyscraper up in Manhattan. Um, and, you know, you should do research on an artist before you commission them to do work for you. Because Diego did this huge mural, and it was really involved with lots of um, different figures like this. But it had like a huge portrait of Karl Marx, and it was showing some communist ideals. And so Rockefeller was like, absolutely not. I have to have this torn down. I'm not going to, you know, continue or give you money for this. And so there was this big, huge, famous feud between Diego Rivera and Rockefeller. Um, Rockefeller Center. So, yeah, do some research on who you're going to get to uh, commission artwork from because, of course, he's if he did his research, he would have learned that Diego was communist and it was one of his favorite subject matters to paint. And there you go. Dream of a Sunday afternoon in the Alameda Park. Um, guys, take care today. Let me know if you have any questions about these works. And here are some ideas to contemplate as we move into tomorrow. Can art be an idea? Can art be an action?